Uh, if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to open up to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. And uh, we will, of course, continue our series. We're going to be in for a while. Uh, in the Gospel according to Matthew, we're going to be walking with Jesus, uh, hopefully for the rest of our lives, of course, but walking with Jesus through the Gospel of Matthew for uh, approximately the next three years or so, because it's a big, meaty, weighty book, and there's a lot to, co to cover and talk about in the Gospel of Matthew. There's a lot of stuff that's easy to miss if you're just either really familiar with it or if you're reading it just kind of quickly. Uh, there's a lot of important background stuff that we need to, to cover to understand what's going on in the Gospel of Matthew. So that's what we're going to be doing. And of course, because this is the Sunday before Christmas, I did plan this. Uh, the, we are talking about the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Matthew today. We will be reading the, the birth narrative. Um, so we, of course, have four Gospels in our Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are what are called the synoptic Gospels. Everybody say the word synoptic with me. One, two, three, synoptic. And that means they, are, they basically take the same view of things. They look the same direction in the same way. They tell many of the same stories, with some with greater detail, some with lesser. Gospel of Mark is the briefest of all of the Gospels. Uh, the Gospel of Luke is the longest and most detailed of all of the Gospels, uh, and so on and so forth. But they, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke basically tell a lot of the same material, sometimes a little bit differently, sometimes quite the same. And then the Gospel of John is off by itself, kind of doing its own thing sometimes. Uh, but uh, so between the, two, the, the kind of the Gospels that have the two birth narratives of Jesus are the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. And most of us, most of what we know from the, the birth narrative or the birth story of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ actually comes from the Gospel of Luke because it has a lot more detail. It's got a lot more to tell. And and uh, it, it gives us a very specific perspective on the gospel uh, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, or the birth specifically. And the gospel of Luke gives us the perspective of Mary. But the gospel according to Matthew is different from that in that it gives us a briefer picture and it gives us uh, uh, the kind of the perspective of Joseph. And so our big idea today is that Joseph in this text provides us a godly example of how we can respond to God's working in our lives. Uh, and specifically, sometimes when God is doing things in our lives, we don't expect him to do. Uh, because very much the Christmas narrative is about God doing something surprising that was by many people unexpected, especially Joseph and Mary, and doing it in such a way that was just kind of a huge surprise. And so we're going to have Joseph's perspective on this, which is actually your first fill-in. Uh, the birth of Jesus is viewed through the perspective of Joseph in the Gospel of Matthew. Our first fill-in is the birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew is viewed through the perspective of Joseph. And one of the things that I kind of feel it's important to say at this point is we don't get to spend a lot of time with Joseph. He is in this beginning portion. We'll see him a little bit this week, and I think a little bit next week. But kind of after that point, he disappears. And I think there's a reason for that that isn't explicit in the Bible, but is the kind of the likely, very likely answer is that after we see Jesus when he's very, very young, at some point, Joseph dies. Okay? And that's the re kind of some of the reasons that we know that is we see Mary and she's out in public and she's not with her husband. 
And the only time in the Jewish culture in the ancient world that you would see that was if her husband had died. The, the, the wives never appeared in public by themselves. And so there's, a lot, there's indications like that in the text that Joseph, by the time Jesus is an adult and doing his ministry, Joseph is probably passed away. He's probably dead. That's the most likely. So I think it's important for us to spend a little bit of time with Joseph, kind of get to know him because God chose him. God chose Joseph for this very important, very specific task of being the earthly uh, kind of adoptive father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Joseph would have had a very important role as protector and father and leader of this family, specifically that, of course, now that they have this child in their lives who is the son of God. Right? Kind of, sort of, no pressure, Joseph, but here is this that you get to participate and look after for the, the first one little while in your life. Uh, so, we're going to spend some time with Joseph today. So, if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 18. We're going to start out by reading verses 18 through 19. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 19. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. All right. So, backing up the train here. Uh, so, we've got, we finally meet Joseph. We finally meet Joseph kind of right away in the, in the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. And we, we actually learn, for, for only being able to spend very little amount of time with him, we learn some important things about him. Uh, first is this here. Joseph, in verse 19, being a just man. Joseph being a just man. Now, we have a tendency to categorize people in a lot of different ways in our world and our culture. One of the ways is when we're talking about a guy who's doing pretty well, he's, he's, a, he's a good guy, we basically say that, don't we? Oh yeah, he's a good guy. We like, we like him. We like Joe. Joe is a nice guy. He's there for you when you need somebody to talk. He's there for you when you need you know, you know, a pickup truck to help you move your stuff or something like that. Yeah, yeah, Joe, Joe's a good guy. When we're talking about just, that's not what we have in mind. Okay? I'm not saying Joseph wasn't a good guy, so let's not go there. But what I am saying is that when the text tells us that Joseph is a just man, it has something specific in mind. And what it specifically has in mind is this. Joseph, in his character, is the kind of person who strenu strenuously seeks to live his life according to God's ways. He's not just a nice guy. He's not just an all-around good guy. He's a just guy. He lives his life according to what God has said. And this is likely the reason given to us in the text that God has selected Joseph for this task. Because he is a person who lives his life by the word of God. Joseph's spirituality is not casual. Joseph's spirituality is not casual. And he provides for us, therefore, an example of how we are to live our lives in a similar fashion. Many of us fall prey at moments to the temptation to kind of go, that's a thing I do on Sunday morning. That's a thing I do maybe on Wednesday night. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pray every once, I'll pray before a meal or whatever, or I'll read my Bible you know, once a week. But that's very a, kind of a, a casual approach to doing life with God. And God is not casual about us. Did you know that God is not casual about you? God deeply feels for you. God deeply 
cares for you. God is deeply concerned about you. Do we, in response, return the favor like Joseph? Or are we casual? Or is it just a thing that we tack on to our week and say, yeah, maybe I'll get to that later. Joseph provides for us an example. He's not just a nice guy. He's not just a good guy. He's a just guy. And just has to do not simply with sort of that legal justice that you think about. He wants to right all wrongs. It's, he lives according to God's law or God's ways of doing things. So Joseph is a just guy. That's kind of the first important thing that we read about Joseph. Now we're backing up here to verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Now, stop right there. When two people in our world get engaged to be married... It is entirely possible that that engagement can be pretty easily and pretty quickly broken if the kind of the situation arises. Weird question. Has anybody here ever been engaged and not married in a specific? I have. Oh, a couple of us. Hey, we're a small club. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. That, that is a possibility for some folks, is that you, you get engaged to a person, you maybe find out some things, or maybe they find out some things, okay? And it can be pretty easily cut off at that point, and maybe the worst that happens is some really hurt feelings and an expensive ring is paid for, right? Like, now what do I do with this thing? It's always a weird situation. Okay, not the same in the, in the biblical situation. The biblical situation, a betrothal, is a legally binding agreement, they have already begun the marriage process. So at this point, if this relationship, which is a covenantal or a contractual relationship, is to be ended, it requires a divorce. It actually requires a divorce for them to, to kind of put this, this relationship and pull it apart and say, no, we're not going to get married. And it requires a lot of difficult, heartache, broken, stressful work to get this kind of relationship to where it won't come to its completion in a marriage. And so when it says uh, that uh, his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, legal binding agreement, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And I hopefully don't have to explain to you what the problem is here. Right? Okay, because they're not married and they haven't had that union of marriage to produce a child. And she has been found to be with child. So the natural assumptions, of course, are unfaithfulness has occurred. Unfaithfulness has occurred on the part of Mary. But we are given some clues, of course, here in the text, in the scripture, to let us know that there is no wrong that has been done on Mary's part. So the very first people who encountered this, this would have had to have been explained to. We are so familiar we are so familiar with the text of Scripture. We're so familiar, at least, with the story of the first Christmas that sometimes we forget to stop and think of just how severe and how scary this would have been for somebody like Mary and for Joseph. How, uh, what are we going to do now? But we are told Mary, yes, was found to be with child, but she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to be told one more time in this text that the Holy Spirit is involved in this process. And I'm going to dive a little bit more into why that's important for the text when we get to that point. But I want you to kind of focus for just a moment on the Holy Spirit.
Now, for a Jewish person, first century, this is a little weird because we're not simply talking about the fact that there is one God. Now we're talking about how there is one God, eternally existent, but he, he exists eternally in three distinct persons. We're beginning to look at what becomes known a few hundred years later, tagged as the doctrine of the Trinity. Tagged as the doctrine of the Trinity, which is that there is one God. It's still one God. We're still monotheistic. One God. But He eternally exists in three distinct but co-equal persons. Father, Son, who is the baby here, of course, and the Holy Spirit. So God is showing up in interesting ways in this text. And we'll get to a little bit more on the Holy Spirit in uh, just a moment. But then coming back to verse 19, And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So Joseph looks at the situation. Joseph knows Something different has happened here that he wasn't expecting. And something is going to have to be done about it. Because Joseph, thinking there's unfaithfulness, is rightly not willing to, to join himself to an unfaithful person. Though he has not yet heard that that is not what has happened. But I want us to focus on something here. Note Joseph's character. Joseph does not run straight to victimhood. He does not go, I have been wronged. He does not go out. He does not confront. He does not point the finger. He does not seem to get angry. He actually has a completely different tack that he goes after here. He seeks to protect the one person whom he at this point is assuming has wronged him. Because here's what the potential outcome is. If Joseph accuses her of unfaithfulness, she, according to the law, could be stoned to death. Which is why we're told here, Joseph being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame. It didn't require, it was a possibility. He takes the tack, he takes the track, he takes the possibility of, I don't want this person who is truly the vulnerable person here. I don't want this person to be put to shame and I don't want her to be essentially put to death. I don't want to subject her to that. So it says he resolved, he decided, he came to the conclusion that he was going to divorce her quietly, which means he's not going to make a huge deal of this. But his character tells us something about him. Not only is he a just man, he is a compassionate and kind man. Joseph is both just and compassionate, which these are two very, very important qualities that we actually find in the heart of God. Joseph is reflecting one, his father in heaven, by being both a just person and a compassionate person. He is being one who is both just and compassionate, both both according to living strenuously according to what is true and good and right according to God's word and at the same time seeking to be merciful because God is both of those things and now we're seeing that reflected in Joseph and that makes it an important example for us are we both just and compassionate because here's the reality. We will probably, in a lot of cases, tend to go one way or the other. We will either tend to be a law person or we will tend to be a compassion person. We will tend to be either a law person, which is we want to see right, we want to see punishment, we want to see things get addressed and corrected, or we might be a compassion person, a person who says, Let's just slow down, 
calm down, be kind to one another. Joseph shows us that both of those, these things can actually live together in the same heart. Both of these things can live together in the same person. We don't have to be just one or the other. We can be both. We can be both. Joseph, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. He doesn't run to victimhood. He seeks to protect the one that he thinks did the wrong because that one wrong person, at least wrong in his mind, is the vulnerable person. So he's just, but he's also compassionate and merciful. Number two, the birth of Jesus is about God's work to save man. The birth of Jesus is about God's work to save man or save humanity. That's why Jesus is born into the world. Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. It's talking about Joseph Sill, and it says, But as he considered these things, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So first, Joseph, he's thinking about this, and he's, it says he's resolved. He's come to the conclusion that this is how he's going to act. He's going to divorce Mary quietly. But he says, as he considered these things. So he's now working out kind of how he's going to go about this, because this is a big, long, complicated process. As he considered these things, behold, an angel appeared to him in a dream and saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear. One of the most repeated commands in the Bible is this. Don't. Be afraid. Don't be afraid. And, you know, for example, in the Gospel of Luke, when the shepherds are out on the hillside and the angel appears to them and the whole host of angel appears to them, the command there is, hey, don't be afraid, because the sight is terrifying. Here it's not linked to the sight of the angel. Here it's linked to the situation that Joseph finds himself in. It is a scary situation for Joseph because it means he has to take certain responsibilities and the vulnerability of Mary, even though he's assuming she has wronged him, is still on him to deal with after a fashion. And it's scary. And this angel appears to him as he's considering this, as he's thinking, as he's trying to sort out the situation. The angel appears to him in a dream and says, Joseph, do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear to take Mary as your wife. And, and, and why should he fear? Well, for a number of reasons. Some of the reasons we've already mentioned. Another reason People talk, especially in a small village where they don't have TV. They don't have anything else to do. There's no Netflix, right? There's no coffee shop. There is people to talk to. And in a small village, there's no way to keep this totally quiet try as he might. Do you nervously ask what people will think of you sometimes? You ask yourself, well, what are they going to think when I say this? Or what are they going to think if I do this? Or if I make this decision, how are they going to respond? Same thing for Joseph. Except for somebody's life is at stake at this point. Joseph exemplifies for us enduring humiliation for God, because sometimes we have to do that. 
Joseph isn't going to endure humiliation. This angel appears to him and says, you're going to marry this gal. Don't be afraid to marry this gal. And that, that's going to mean something, you guys. That's going to mean that people are going to look at this because they don't just up and move to a different city like we do today if something really bad happens. Right? We, have, we live in a fairly transient society. It's easy to you know, run a U-Haul, pack it, go to another place, another town, another city, another state, another country even. It's, it's possible that we, do, we can do that. They don't do that in that culture. Because they're so linked to things like their land or their business, which was be located where they live, that they don't just up and move. They can't do that. So Joseph knows that he, if he's going to marry Mary, he's going to be there and he's going to hear the people talking. When he walks away, he will hear the whispers. Oh, there he goes. I can't believe he married her after what she did to him. Because uh, are they going to explain this to people? No, 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 look. Holy Spirit's involved. Are they going to buy that? No, they're not going to buy that. Our world doesn't buy that. Nobody buys that. The only reason Joseph buys that, because an angel confronts him to his face and says, look, pal, what is conceived in Mary is from the Holy Spirit. The only reason Joseph buys that is because God has sent a messenger to him, and you believe that messenger. Nobody else is going to buy it. Joseph and Mary are going to have to endure. And Joseph is going to be humiliated on account of it, which means his business could suffer. Which means his livelihood is potentially at stake. This is, this is potentially not just socially or emotionally humiliating. There is greater humiliation that might have to be endured on Joseph's part here. So the angel shows up and says, don't, don't be afraid. Because that's our natural reaction. Something changes that we're not expecting. Whew, turn on the fear. We have in our brains, a part of our brain that will tend to do one of two responses to a hard situation, fight or flight. Joseph is fighting the flight response. Joseph is fighting the fear response. And the angel comes and says, you don't worry about that. God has you because this is God's work that is going on here. He says, this is from the Holy Spirit. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So the second uh, time we're encountering the Holy Spirit in the text of Matthew chapter 1 here. As his presence, the Holy Spirit's presence, signals the beginning of a lot of things in Scripture, there are two huge things that the presence of the Holy Spirit is important for in the Old Testament. The very first one is at the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. But what? The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Holy Spirit present at the, at the moments of creation signals the beginning of creation. The second big one is actually found in the book of the Exodus. And it's a little less clear in the Exodus narrative, but what happens in the Exodus narrative is they have finally been released from bondage and slavery in Egypt. They are traveling and they come to Yom Suf, they come to the Red Sea. And they have charging behind them Pharaoh's army. And so they're between the sea and this army that threatens them. And God says, all right, Moses, don't worry. I got you back. That's my translation. And has Moses hold up the staff 
and the sea parts. But what's fascinating is in the text, it says, and a strong east wind hits the water and then the sea parts. Now, the fascinating thing behind the word wind in the Old Testament is the exact same word for spirit in Genesis chapter 1. It's the word ruach. It's the word war. And in Genesis chapter 1, the spirit hovered over the water in Exodus. Ruach hits the water. The water divides and the people are delivered. And the people get to go through. So there's creation and there's deliverance. And in Jesus, what is meant to be heard in the echo chamber of the scripture is that when the Holy Spirit is involved at this moment, it's at the beginning of a new testament, as the Holy Spirit was beginning at the uh, present at the beginning of the Old Testament, there is, through this person, there's a new creation and a new exodus that is going to become available. So the presence of the Holy Spirit is not just functional to get Jesus into the womb of Mary. The Holy Spirit is there to signal some other things. That through what is conceived in Mary by the Holy Spirit, there is a new creation that is going to result. And there is a new exodus, a new uh, leaving bondage and slavery that is going to become available for the people of God in a brand new world. Way So the Holy Spirit is very important. As His presence signaled the beginning of the creation and the exodus, here it signals an entrance of the one who will bring new creation and new exodus. And then He says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name what? That's the English word. It's Joshua. It's the Hebrew back behind it. It's Joshua. It's Yeshua. It's God saves. That's what his name means. That's what his name means. His name means God saves. You will call his name God saves. You will call his name God saves. Yahweh saves. His very name describes his purpose and plan for coming to the earth. So, Joseph, don't be afraid, not just because the Holy Spirit has conceived this in Mary, but also because he's going to be the Savior. He's going to be the Deliverer. He's going to be the one who starts new creation. Call his name Yeshua. Call his name Jesus, which means God saves all this took place, it says, to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The coming of Christ is the fulfillment of a long before this revealed plan. Like hundreds of years before this, that prophecy was recorded by Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 is the reference here. God made a promise that he was going to send an Emmanuel, which very simply means God is with us. How, how will Joshua, how will Jesus save his people? Well, the answer is right here. Because God himself is going to be with us. God himself is going to be with us. Now here we have two important and essential doctrines or teachings of the Christian faith. Two essential Christian doctrines. Number one is the doctrine of the virgin conception and birth of Jesus Christ. The virgin conception and birth of Jesus Christ. That, that he was not born into this world through natural means. He was not conceived through natural means. But God enacted a miracle 
to signal that this child was not going to be just any normal human being. So that's the first, the doctrine of the virgin birth and conception. Uh, the second doctrine is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And the doctrine of the incarnation is this. The second person of the Trinity added a second nature to himself. He was, as Philippians chapter 2 says, by nature, God. But then he also took upon himself the form of a servant, or he took upon himself an additional nature, a human nature. He is, as, uh, as one creed puts it, both truly God and truly man. That's what the incarnation of Jesus Christ is all about. It is that he is God with us. And he is God with us in such a way that he actually took on human flesh to be with us. Because what's fascinating about God, and as we find him in the Old Testament, is nobody gets to look directly at him. Nobody gets to hang out very closely with God unless they want to be obliterated. Because his presence is too glorious, too bright, too powerful, too magnificent for a human being to be able to stand and live in his presence. And so what God does in order to be with us is he wraps himself and clothes himself in a human nature. He adds to himself a second nature. He is both truly God and truly man. That's what Philippians chapter 2 says, as I've already mentioned. Uh, who, being in the form of God, took upon himself the form of a servant and became humble and obedient, uh, even to death on a cross, which is, of course, where this is all headed. That's, of course, where this is all headed. Because Christmas is bright and glorious and good and about the generosity of a loving God, but it's headed towards dark days. It's headed toward the darkest moment in all of history when humanity as one takes the Son of God, God in human flesh, and nails him to a cross and executes him in the most brutal fashion imaginable. Christmas is absolutely necessary to get us to Easter. It's absolutely necessary to get us to Easter. And point number three, Joseph teaches us the right response to God's plan, which is the response of obedience. Joseph teaches us the right response to God's plan, to obey, to say, yes, Lord, to say, yes, Lord. Matthew chapter 1, verses 24 through 25, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Oops. So, right there, he did as commanded. He obeyed. Joseph obeyed. It's such a simple statement for such a profound reality especially among a historically rebellious people. If you were to go to Isaiah, and you were to go and start reading from the beginning of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, we begin to read uh, of God's understanding of his people and how they are in relationship to him. And that relationship is constantly characterized by rebellion. That, that relationship is constantly characterized by rebellion, by open treason on the part of God's own people. People saying, no, we want to do this our way. That's how God describes it in the first couple chapters of Isaiah. It's not pretty. And it's not encouraging. But he, he finds one among his people whom is a just man. 
who says, I do care about God and what God has said. And not only is he just, but he's compassionate, like God is compassionate. And, and God says, Joseph, I have a job for you. Now, of course, Mary is important. Of course, there's much that we could say about Mary. Matthew just isn't as interested as Luke is in telling that part of it. If you want to know about Mary, if you want to study Mary and her role in all of this, go read Luke's Gospel. There's a lot of great and important things, especially the song of Mary that she sings in response to finding out that what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She's got this amazing piece of poetry that she responds with out of that. But we're talking about Joseph. Now, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as commanded. Do we do as God commands? Do we obey? Do we care about what God has said? Joseph provides a godly example of how to respond to correction because he was wrong about Mary. He was a just man. He was a compassionate man. He was still wrong about Mary. And he needed God to correct him on that. And that's exactly what happened. And this is his response to the correction. He'd been wrong about Mary, but now that he's been corrected, he changes direction without complaint. He says, okay, then this is what we will do. I will bow to you, Lord, on this. How do we treat what God has already revealed to us in Scripture? Because this is what God has said to us. Do we obey? Do we obey? Joseph has provided for us the example. God spoke to Joseph through this angel, and Joseph says, Yes, Lord. God has spoken to us. How do we respond? Do we even know what he has said? Because if we don't know what he has said, we can't say, Yes, Lord. If we refuse to know what he has said, we've already said, No, Lord. Our way, my way, not yours. But what does Jesus teach the disciples? How does Jesus teach them how to pray? Spoiler alert from a little bit later in the Gospel of Matthew. Your will be done. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, let's do things your way. That's what Joseph teaches us. Joseph shows us how to respond in obedience. Joseph teaches us how to say, yes, Lord, when the situation looks weird, when it looks unexpected, when it looks like something that we never would have planned for ourselves, but it is what God is doing, do we say, yes, Lord? Because that's the example provided for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Joseph. We thank you that you selected him as the example. Because he in many ways is a clear example of living as one who is just, who cares about the things of God. But who is also compassionate, who cares about the vulnerable in his life. Help us. Help us to be that way. For we are in need of both justice and compassion. And you have shown both to us through Jesus. You did not simply wipe away and, and dismiss our sins without any, so anything being paid. Jesus, in justice, in accordance with your law, took upon us the punishment that we deserved. For he is just. But he took upon that punishment for us because he is also compassionate because we are vulnerable and we are in need of rescue. As was Mary, so are we. We are vulnerable. Thank you for the example of Joseph and thank you for the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, who came into the world to save sinners.
to save us, for we are always in desperate need of him. We thank you, God, as we remember that holy night when he was born into this world. May we lift our hearts in praise in response to what you have done. We pray all of these things in your name. Amen.